at, uh, at Apollo Hospital, Delhi, will chair the session of airway. Vikram Majan, sir. Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you've all had an enjoyable lunch. Uh, <clears throat> so this session is going to be on the airways. Uh, <clears throat> we all know <clears throat> that managing airways is the cornerstone in anesthesia. Uh, and as anesthetists, it is our like fundamental responsibility in all cases, whether it is in the ICU, whether it is in the OR, <clears throat> it is our prime responsibility. And, and sometimes we do face with a difficult airway situation. And most often it is when you least expect it. Because you all, when we anticipate a difficult airway, we all plan it. But sometimes it is the un unanticipated airway, and so it's better to have, uh, you know, various plans in mind: plan A, plan B, plan C, plan D. All can go also wrong, because when the crisis happens, you know, there's so much of information going on that it is hard to concentrate for the anesthetist at that time. Uh, he's overburdened with all the information that is that things are going around. So I think it's, it's better to have a, a, a plan there as well. So this airway session, we've got some esteemed uh, speakers who will give their experiences. Uh, we've got four topics that we like to cover. The first one is going to be covered by Dr. Vidya Mohan Ram, uh, who's the HOD anesthesia at Fortis Chennai. And, uh, She's done MBBS MD from Jipma Pondicherry. So let's welcome her. Thank you, sir. Uh, good afternoon, everybody. I'm sure you're having a postprandial alkaline tide, and uh, uh, within five minutes, I'm, I suppose all of you will be asleep. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I have a disclaimer I am not a, a pediatric anesthetist in the sense I do all other stuff as well. I'm only an uh, occasional pediatric anesthetist. And um, I will not be covering um, removal of uh, supraglottic airway device because the uh, next speaker who has experience with 5000 uh, IGELs will be talking about that. Similarly, I will not also be discussing about and anticipated difficult extubations because uh, I don't think I have time for that. So uh, when this topic was given to me, they added the tagline, landing is more dangerous than takeoff. And uh, anesthesia has always been compared with aviation and uh, this is no different. And uh, even this article in pediatric anesthesia uh, uh, actually uses the same terminology about landing being more <coughs> dangerous than takeoff. So the apricot study had 13,000 children enrolled and uh, intubations and extubations were done in the operating room. And uh, it, it's a no-brainer. They found that most of the complications ha happened during extubation rather than induction or maintenance and the worst of them being strider <coughs> so i'll be uh, i mean sir mentioned about planning so for the steps of extubation it is uh, preparation <coughs> after that we have to wait for return of spontaneous ventilation then we have to make the critical decision whether we want to extubate the child awake deep or somewhere <coughs> in between and uh, if we have to manage the immediate ext post extubation period, which is much more important in children, especially in infants and uh, neonates than adults. And if and when the problems happen, we should be able to pick up the uh, what is actually happening and immediately respond to it. Because we all know children have very low functional respiratory capacity and they will desaturate very fast. So all of us know about the breathing part. So my talk will m be more about the goal post extubation being of maintaining a patent upper airway and avoiding lung derecruitment. So uh, the reason I put up this slide is where, when it's not a pediatric hospital and you do occasional pediatric surgery, 
then sometimes you may not have the small suction occasionally you might need to do a endotracheal suction or and then you know the eight size or six uh, six french catheters missing so that's why i put that suction as well there and uh, very often in uh, even in literature when this problem happens post extubation uh, things go wrong delining is one of the common uh, problems that happen child is restless struggling there are four people around and the iv line comes out so uh, what i meant by working iv line is it's probably a good practice to actually disconnect the drip at that point in time and uh, maybe make uh, something like a boxing glove uh, around the iv line and just have the port alone uh, visible or reachable so that you can inject any emergency medications uh, the rest of them are uh, no brainers so you, obviously if there is a problem you are going to do back mask ventilation and for rescue <coughs> you need airways and uh, whether you do it for adults or not it is highly recommended that in pediatrics post extubation you must give oxygen supplementation in case things go wrong and there is <coughs> laryngospasm or something you have to be ready the nebulization kit which is um, which can actually fit your breathing circuit you have to make sure the connections are there and obviously whenever you extubate somebody you should have everything ready for the intubations i did mention that i will not be discussing high risk uh, extubations but in such uh, scenarios you might need uh, a bipap machine or a high flow nasal oxygen so uh, how do we decide when to extubate so is the respiratory drive sufficient that is quite easy because we can see the respiratory rate and uh, age appropriate rate is there or not and uh, whether the respiration is regular so it's not that difficult then have the respiratory muscles recovered their force so if we are using uh, any of the modern anesthesia circuits the tidal volume is displayed for you so that again is not uh, difficult and if you are using a jackson reeves we are all used to seeing the bag and figuring out whether the uh, tidal volume is enough the challenge is actually in understanding whether the tone of the upper respiratory uh, uh, upper airway muscles is recovered or not so we all know that the first thing to recover is diaphragm and then the intercostals and the uh, upper airway muscles i've taken the example of genioglossus is the last to recover whether it is from muscle relaxant or it is from inhalational agent or even iv agents then uh, it, we have to understand that all anesthetic <coughs> drugs many of us think dexmed doesn't do it but there is enough study to show probably other than ketamine all anesthetic agents iv or inhalation that we use reduce the inspiratory activity of the upper airway muscles and why is it so important because once the diaphragm and the intercostals recover and the upper airway muscle hasn't recovered the inspiratory effort of the child will actually makes the pharynx collapse so the uh, ph pharyngeal muscles have to get their tone back to be able to keep it splinted open so that is why when we extubate neither deep nor awake we get into these problems and one of the easy methods of uh, though many of us believe that swallowing is a good way of figuring out whether pharyngeal muscles are recovered it's not very sensitive so one of the things is you can you know push the mandible down gently and you can feel the recoil that that is probably more sensitive to decide whether the upper airway muscles have recovered so i just want to play this short video so this is definitely not something that uh, you uh, this child you none of us will think of extubating right so this is a poster uh, for do not extubate so at this point i'd like to thank dr <coughs> ramesh my uh, pediatric anesthesia mentor and friend who specifically took these videos just for this presentation right so uh, there are a lot of objective ways uh, of uh, predicting whether extubation is going to be safe so in that we have eye, eye opening facial grimace pa patient movement other than coughing so very often we are all tempted when the ch child starts to cough and by reflex the limbs flex uh, we tend to think that oh poor child you know is struggling and uh, maybe i will get laryngeal edema or something so i i should remove the tube but that's not the right way so the movement should be other than coughing conjugate gaze is something most of us don't check but actually it's a very sensitive way of if both the eyes uh, you know come together rather than being divergent then that is a good predictor that uh, recovery is good and uh, of course end tidal agents we are all familiar 
again we wouldn't want to try unless the pre-op saturation was low we wouldn't try to extubate a child whose saturation below 97 percent with supplemental oxygen and uh, uh, this positive laryngeal stimulation test i will come to uh, if we have time in the middle and like i said tidal volume more than 5 ml per kg so one of the classic play uh, situations where uh, most of us occasional pediatrician uh, pediatric anesthetists at least definitely do awake intubation is in the newborn so i'd like uh, i told you all the video oh, okay right so um, so this is a child you can see is completely there is purposeful movement there is eye opening and uh, 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 this child should not uh, be having the tube anymore so we will uh, go ahead and extubate this child the other end of the spectrum is deep extubation when will we think of deep, deep extubation when we know there is a reactive airway like an asthmatic child or a child who has had a recent respiratory infection or in situations where we had a lot of uh, neuroanesthesia talks during this session so um, uh, some of the uh, say open eye injury or uh, some other eye operations or even in the neck if the if uh, ankit surgeon does some major uh, cancer surgery he definitely won't want the patient to be coughing because it will cause severe venous bleeding so there are surgeries where we don't want the patient to cough or buck so that may be an indication for a deep extubation and why is it that this cough is so important because cough is a forceful expiration so actually it's like a vital capacity uh, expiration and then if the child is not awake the, the glottis will close and child will have breath holding so we have a situation where the uh, whatever oxygen was inside has come out and then the glottis is closed and nothing more can go in so the child will desaturate much faster so that is why uh, we try to avoid when the when the child is extubating when the child is coughing so uh, this is an example of a uh, deep extubation so um, as you can see the inhalation agent is still on and uh, the child is breathing regularly and uh, there is no response to the uh, stimuli and here i'd like to talk about what is this uh, though i don't practice it it's just for postgraduates if you're taking the exam so laryngeal stimulation test is when the child you pull on the tube and you if the child is not deep the child will immediately uh, breath hold and then if the breath holding is for a short period say after 5 or 10 second child starts breathing then you are all right but if child is in the stage 2 uh, condition then uh, when you pull the tube and apnea comes the child continues to hold the breath so that is an extremely dangerous uh, um, state to extubate so here you can see he has stuck on the tube and still there is no response and uh, uh, waiting to make sure that uh, you know just above the glottis probably the tube is and still a uh, child is breathing uh, nicely and then uh, he'll go ahead and extubate the child and after extubating the child uh, then he will actually shut off the vaporizer and increase the flow rate so if you're on a low flow or whatever and you want to do a deep extubation uh, you will not increase the flow rate uh, till you finish extubation you will cut off the agent and then uh, uh, extubate so here you can see the child is still breathing nicely there is no airway obstruction and you immediately supplement with a mask and you do uh, you know ma maintain the airway with our usual uh, uh, triple maneuver or jaw thrust sorry i am technically challenged yeah so what most of us do is neither this fully for most patients when we do routinely say uh, uh, pediatric child with a uh, hernia or a uh, lap appendicectomy or whatever um, very often we don't we neither do fully awake nor uh, deep because deep uh, necessarily means that the mac is above one and um, i don't think many of us extubate at that point in time except in special circumstances so what i will call what we do is uh, you know just in time extubation so uh, so uh, one of the other things so this is just a uh, you know i i will show you the article uh, uh, this is a very well written article and i uh, re highly recommend that uh, you read it 
so you you don't do suction after the child is awake you do it before that and you never use 100% oxygen you use less than that and uh, we mm. saw in that first video how the child's uh, breathing was uh, bad so we look make sure there is no thoraco abdominal uh, asynchrony and there's no tachypnea and you know then uh, we saw how the conjugate gaze is important so then next is this the extubation is done at the end of inspiration just like i said after the cough the lung empties and then if the glottis closes child will uh, desaturate when you extubate at the end of inspiration even if the child breath holds a little bit actually the lung is full of uh, oxygen so you will get that just that extra time before the child desaturates and then uh, you know so that is uh, that is the uh, one of the maybe subconsciously we are doing it but uh, you know while reading for this talk i realized that it's actually has a scientific basis for it so how do we enhance the safety of extubation all of us routinely do so uh, one of my pet uh, you know two of my pet topics one is low flow anesthesia and, and another is neuromuscular blockade monitoring uh, now low flow anesthesia has been taken up by everybody but uh, neuromuscular blockade monitor is still uh, lagging behind so people don't even use them in adults don't even use them when they are using infusion so it's a bit of a challenge but actually there is evidence to suggest that you know we should be doing neuromuscular blockade monitoring even in children because uh, it uh, helps you to decide the dose of neostigmine and uh, neostigmine unnecessarily given when already neuromuscular recovery has happened can actually have detrimental effect on the upper airway muscles so why did uh, i did mention about avoiding 100% oxygen why because 100% 100% oxygen causes lung volume loss and ventilation inhomogeneity so uh, definitely don't use more than 80% oxygen so one way to go is if the child is stable and you are on steady state say low flow anesthesia you are on 50% oxygen you can extubate and then immediately after extubation you can increase the oxygen while waiting for child to come out if you use oxygen then sometimes it can land up being for 3 4 5 6 minutes and that that's where the problem comes but immediately after extubation you can always use 100% oxygen for a while and within 15 20 seconds you will know whether the child is all right or not and then reduce um so uh, and recruitment maneuver uh, most of us do it in adults right so even the technicians in the ot when you say deflate the cuff they'll deflate and somebody will you know uh, press the bag before you extubate but many times we don't do that in children so but that that's another thing that can help to prevent immediate post extubation um hypoxia and uh, other thing is we can use the upper airways the most uh, susceptible like i said so we can use gravity to i uh, keep the pharynx open so i normally turn the child over to lateral position uh, unless it's contraindicated because of the surgery and then proceed to uh, reverse and uh, then extubate the child so you have uh, so the less chance of airway obstruction uh, secretions will just uh, gently come out by the side so um, that is one thing at the very least i remove the head ring so that you know the you can change the orientation of the head and neck to keep the um, airway open Oh, and very small children or neonates they they even recommend putting a small roll under the shoulder so that the neck is totally extended cpap is a very underutilized thing uh, it doesn't have to be a cpap machine or a bipap machine the simple whatever uh, circuit you are using we can just uh, and the apl valve we can keep it at 5 or 10 and uh, that that is enough for the immediate post extubation cpap so i'd like to spend again some time on this why because cpap helps to maintain a patent upper airway most of the time when we get into trouble after extubation in a pediatric patient 9 out of 10 times it's because of upper airway obstruction so if we handle that most of it will be over so by acting as a pneumatic splint and also counteracts the loss of functional residual capacity after extubation and definitely in children with obstructive sleep apnea or any facial anomalies it is likely to be very helpful again in neonates it actually helps to uh, you know tide over the time till the laryngeal break starts uh, functioning then when you hear that grunt coming then you can stop the cpap so um, though i had said i will not uh, discuss uh, difficult extubation we have to be ready we, before uh, extubating what are the patients where we expect a difficult extubation it could be patient factors it could be intubation factors or it could be surgical factors so if um, like i like we discussed if child has had a recent upper respiratory infection or has history of uh, bronchial asthma or has osa or some laryngotracheal malaria we know that we are 
expecting trouble. In which case, if it is upper airway infection or uh, known asthmatic, we can always use some salbutamol puffs through the tube before we extubate. If there is a history of obstructive sleep apnea, though in children we normally don't use nasopharyngeal airway because we are worried about the adenoids, but th that is something you can keep in mind. And for laryngotracheal malacia, no, you can keep ready proper CPAP machine itself. If you had a terrible time intubating, you know that you could get into trouble during extubation. So you could, uh, or if the child had bronchospasm at induction, you know that it can again happen during extubation. So most of us use dexamethasone as part of multimodal analgesia these days. So probably almost every child would be getting steroid, but if you hadn't given, you could think of uh, giving that. And uh, if uh, the surgery, uh, like we discussed in the previous slide, if the surgery involves uh, where post surgery you expect either edema or uh, any vocal cord paralysis or something, uh, you can be ready. So uh, since we don't have time, I will not go through this uh, post extubation. I, I'd like to leave this slide. It's I found this very useful. It's from the Canadian Airway <coughs> Focus Group. It uh, easy to remember. Reverse, right? At the end of surgery, we uh, reverse. So uh, so by uh, it's a, you know, you can remember the mnemonic, reversal, extubation plan, verify, extubate, recovery, safe and extubation failure plan. <coughs> These are the articles. This is a wonderful article. I strongly recommend you uh, lead it. There isn't much literature on pediatric extubation, especially just anesthesia. There may be literature about ICU, but there's not much uh, literature on, so this is a wonderful article. This is another article which is, uh, which so easy to read it's just like story it's no i know you can it's really nice and the what i didn't discuss you can get it from <coughs> here. so how to develop extubation strategy in a difficult pediatric airway thank you for your patient listening uh, thank you dr vidya very well spoken you i think, uh, gave a good description of how the uh, children should be extubated either deep or uh, awake uh, one of the things I, would can, I can just add is that once a problem happens, say for example, you have not extubated in the right plane because that can happen still, uh, the, the child develops, uh, say, a, a, a laryngeal spasm. Uh, one of the techniques I found very useful, so I thought I'll share is, apart from doing the other things, giving 100% oxygen and, you know, doing and maybe giving propofol and last thing is giving uh, a muscle relaxant but uh, uh, doing a, a like a Larson uh, maneuver which is like you know giving a very painful sort of a stimuli uh, at the styloid process and at the same time lifting the jaw that often you know helps in the child starts breathing again and the larynx opens the geniohoid muscle it pulls the parapharynx up and it opens sometimes it, it does happen so I, I just thought I'll share that with you. Uh, and uh, uh, yeah, that laryngeal stimulation test also I use quite often. So I think that's also very useful that you very, uh, very uh, well I, described. Um, uh, is it safe in uh, cuff tracheal tubes, sir? It's just my doubt because I don't use it regularly. Yeah, yeah, it is Even safe. In cuff yeah, yeah, tube yeah, 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 it is safe. But you just have to wait for that five seconds at least they should start... Uh, uh, Breathing and then you know it is a good indicator. If it is not, don't extubate. If if the child that prolonged apnea on laryngeal stimulation test is uh, absolute no absolute, no for extubation. Do not extubate even if the child is you know, like that picture was. You know, but so yeah. Any questions? And okay, okay, fine. Thank you for not Thank falling you. asleep. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so the next topic is uh, eye gels, the supraglottic airways. We know how supraglottic uh, airways they normally help us in anesthesia, in uh, providing aid to intubation, providing rescue. Uh, you know, oxygenation at times in when we are facing difficult airways. So there, it is a very versatile product. And now, even it is replacing the endotracheal tube. For laparoscopic surgeries, people have been using it. And Dr. Pranav Gupta, I would like to uh, call on the stage. He's a freelance anesthetist at Meerut, and he 
has got a vast experience of uh, with IGELs. So welcome. Thank you, sir. Thank you, uh, Tapcon, for giving me this opportunity to present my work. And I came into my anesthesia practice in 2010. And at the approximately same time, one of my colleagues gave anesthesia to a patient who was a 35-year-old obese male. He gave a supracavicular blaker plexus block. The position of surgery was lateral. He was not, uh, the block effect was not adequate, so he gave sedation. And then he landed up into cannot intubate, cannot ventilate. And he had to go through all the problems, paper, legal problems, and death threats, and everything else, because the patient had died. Similarly, one of my colleagues was giving anesthesia in an MRI suit. There was no supraglottic airway device. There was no method of securing the airway, and the patient died. Again, after some time, after a few months, he gave anesthesia to another patient. The supraglottic airway device was there, because when I went, I made sure that supraglottic airway device must be there. But he was not comfortable using it. He did never use it, and the patient died. 2021, he was giving anesthesia to a patient for ovum pickup. He used to intubate that patient regularly. She was a chubby patient, young female who came for uh, ovum pickup, and she died. Death rate is very, very high in places where freelancers have got their free will to do whatever they want. We are a anesthesiologist, around 50 anesthesiologists are sitting here. You will see the same anesthesiologist at different con conferences because I believe there are two types of anesthesiologists. One, dynamic anesthesiologists who are sitting here, who want to improve themselves, who do good work. And there are some regular anesthesiologists who continue to do the same thing, who doesn't want to improve, and who do compromise patients' life. We in India have no control over those anesthesiologists who after 22 gauge cannula, hypotensive cardiac arrest would be explaining to the patient instead of giving uh, fluid. So I come back to my topic. Why? First of all, there is no financial or non-financial relationship with the product which I'm going to speak. And the difficult airway algorithm says that the supraglottic airway device should be in our plan B. It also says, uh, it is also included in difficult airway algorithm and 2020 ACLS guidelines even ask us to keep it in plan A. So whether it is in a hospital or out of hospital, we can use and we should use supraglottic airway device as plan A. While I was discussing with uh, my colleagues, since yesterday, some of them use it day in and day out. When I went to Surat to uh, deliver a lecture, I came to know that most anesthesiologists are using day in and day out, in prone position, in supine position, in laparoscopic surgeries, and the only problem which we think is reuse. But we are living in India, and we have those lectures in the morning where we saw, saw the jugaad. We should be saving patients' life. Saving patients' life is more important than following guidelines. So why IGEL? Because when I entered my practice in 2010, the most advanced supraglottic airway device which I thought was one which I can keep at every nursing home was IGEL. I cannot keep at every anesthesia location a prosil LMA, which was gave the same pressure as IGEL, which was safest as IGEL. IGEL is able, we are able to insert very quick, quickly. So coming on to the development of airway, like we were talking about, if we are able to uh, push the air into the trachea 
we are able to save the life of the patient. Airway discovery started and in, uh, the change came in 1988 when LMA was discovered by Dr. Archie Brain. He had uh, used in more than 7,000 subjects before it was launched. And 2007, IGEL came after five years of research. Miller in 2004 divided the uh, supraglottic airway devices according to the sealing mechanism. And now we have first and second generation. First generation are simple airway tube and second generation prevents aspiration, have a higher seal pressure, have an integral bite block. So these are the different airway devices. And now we are having Busca mask. So Busca mask is sometimes called as third generation airway devices. It is not easily available in, at present and it has been developed by an Australian couples. There, there have been millions of times which IGEL have been used, supraglottic airway devices have been used and uh, if you see this study, uh, sorry. this study of 700 parturients patients in caesarean sections in LMA Supreme was published in Canadian Journal. So, if we are reluctant to use in uh, caesarean sections, we can use it. This is IGEL, which is a superior than LMS Supreme. It has got a gastric channel, an integral bite block, a buccal cavity stabilizer, an epiglottis rest, which prevents the folding of uh, folding of the tube, and it has uh, got a non-inflatable cuff. It has uh, got a distal and for gastric channel, and it is completely fit to the structure. After many, many years of development of uh, LMA, the IGEL was developed and all precautions were taken so that we can use it properly. This is the position of the IGEL when inserted. There are different types of IGEL, 1, 1.5, 2, 2.5, 3, 4, 5. And advantage is easy insertion in a, even in, by non-specialist. So I asked my technicians to insert it. They should know how to insert it. And once an anesthesiologist was not able to insert the tube, my technician inserted an IGEL and saved the patient life. So we should teach all non-medical staff also in the OT to have uh, an experience of using supraglottic airway devices. These are all relative contraindications. Now uh, I would like to play a video, small video of how I use IGEL. This was a URS surgery. The anesthesia was given without relaxant uh, and videos. So I always pre-medicate, give analgesia beforehand and uh, after propofol I wait for the time to, uh, after giving propofol I wait till the patient uh, abolish, uh, respiration is abolished. Once the patient's respiration is abolished, at this time I have not given relaxant. I insert the eye gel and uh, once the eye gel is inserted, I put the patient on oxygen, nitrous and isoflurane without relaxant and without relaxant I am able to give anesthesia to many many of my patients. Most of the URS patients, most of the hysteroscopies, DNCs, I secure the airway. I give a proper ventilation of a good tidal volume of 500 ml, 16 uh, rate and there is no, uh, uh, no compromise on the respiratory rate or pattern, no CO2 rise. Now you can see just it takes less than 2-3 seconds to insert an IGEL and uh, I think everyone of us must have used IGEL and if they have not then they should start using it because when the emergency arises, you will only be able to use it if you are regularly using it. Now we usually insert a suction catheter, this is the way we can insert a suction catheter or a rise tube uh, in the four or five number IGEL, except one number IGEL we can insert in all other uh, IGELs. And uh, 
then we fix the IGEL. Voice कर दीजिएगा। Also confirm by the my machine this is this is 5.20 financial number and my bill. This is so by the middle back. And then now the service will pay him or stimulate him to or I mean the sensation. We can just remove the idol. So a proper pre anesthetic uh, evaluation is must in every patient. At least we should check the airway. Now comes the point that ETCO is extremely important, especially if you are for first 1,000, 2,000 users. So if you are uh, at a place where you have a basic boils and you have uh, uh, do not have an ETCO2, even the ECG is not working, please do not use eye gel, at least for the first 2,000 cases because you will not be able to uh, recognize the folding of eye gel. Analgesia is extremely important to have that safe and uh, the best uh, recovery for the patient. And analgesia, I usually give paracetamol with magnesium sulfate, pre-op, and dexamethasone, dexmedetomidin if required, and opioid. Mostly I use fentanyl, and if not available, tramadol may be used, but mostly. Then uh, KY jelly is recommended, but uh, xylocaine jelly is easily available and we mostly use it. But one of my patients had the only complaint of numbness in the throat. So we started using lubricating jelly and propofol has been recommended in the studies and sometimes I use propofol 2-3 drops and it does wonders. Now let us see a video of insertion of eye gel, different ways uh, with eye which gel. I insert eye gel. This is the way. We can insert single handedly. Even to COVID IGEL. times, when you are obsessed and with something, like I am obsessed with eye gel, I was inserting eye gel even in COVID times. And I will show you why I am obs obsessed. This is another way. Uh, uh, Propofol is given. I will just stabilize the head with my stomach and with one hand, I can easily. Intubate. <coughs> and my oxygen mask. This is why how and when an assistant holds and we can insert it in less than uh, uh, five seconds. We are able to insert. Now, where I have used, I have used eye gel in all these scenario with relaxant in lab coles, TLH, diagnostic lab, and especially in pediatric cataracts. My wife is a pediatric ophthalmologist and her pediatric cataracts and pediatric squint uh, are mostly done under eye gel if it is not interfering with her surgical uh, area. One of my surgeons is very happy uh, for hernias, hydrocele's to be inserted, uh, to be done under GA. And without relaxant, some of the procedures that are regularly done and some might require with uh, relaxation. So if you have a failed spinal, I would give propofol for cesarean section. Suppose we had a lecture, I would give propofol, insert the eye gel, uh, get the case done, and you will uh, see why. Suppose prone positions, uh, like you are giving a spinal for a PCNL. You have given spinal and uh, the patient is prone. Now you want to give sedation. It is better to insert an eye gel and maintain the airway and give proper uh, anesthesia. Do not compromise the airway at any situation. Inside hospital it is recommended. It is recommended outside hospital by the EMR team. Also troubleshooting. If you are not able to uh, ventilate proper then you can adjust the eye gel. You can change the size of the eye gel. You can uh, insert by using laryngoscope. And sometimes, uh, if you give relaxant, then the, uh, uh, the effect properly comes and the ventilation is good with eye gel. And uh, if nothing works, then you have to put an ET tube. Now, coming on to the removal of eye gel, I will show you a... This is a patient of hysteroscopy. Only injection fentanyl and propofol was given. The patient was inserted the eye gel. And... After the completion of the procedure, isoforin has been switched off, nitrous has been switched off, the patient is on oxygen and 
the patient is the vitals are completely stable now sufficient time has passed and i have already asked the patient she is so comfortable with the igel in c2 that she is not having any difficulty i just need to remove the igel and my patient would be fine aap khole nikal do wo khole patient is breathing normally you can see very good amount of tidal volume being generated on the c circuit the purpose of showing these videos is that you cannot CO2 achieve such good the patient can be easily reversal or removal of removed. your endotracheal tube in every patient you can see the response of the patient we are discussing about bronchospasm laryngospasm post extubation it doesn't happen at all theek hai kajal mukh khol liye theek hai so as i told you we have that responsibility as a dynamic anesthesiologist to make sure that we go to our back to our places and we keep a supraglottic airway device whichever it is at every place where anesthesia is going to be given <coughs> and reuse it is almost done in all places most places if you have an eto please get it eto sterilized have many num many igels uh together and keep it it is sterilized otherwise cleaning and keeping in formalin chamber or sidex or soap water cleaning is the most commonly used if it, we do not have so why is the reluctance of using i gel even after 34 years since lma was introduced even we have graduated to one of the best possible device billions of times it has been used it is included in the guidelines still we are not making a standard practice why why we have to ask it why we do not want to give best to the patient you can see with this help of this video lijay. the patient will shift immediately after uh, completion of the surgery ha lag gaya ho gaya operation aapka acha ho gaya ha ji aa ji theek hai muh khulega koi dikkat ho gaya operation aapka हो गया ऑपरेशन पता तो नहीं चला हो ये हाँ जी मेरा हाँ ऑपरेशन हो गया मेरा हाँ जी हो गया पक्का सो एट वेन आई वॉज डूइंग माई पी जी आई यूज टू ट्राई टू गिव दिस टाइप ऑफ एनएसिया टू माई पेशेंट्स आफ्टर मेनी ईयर्स ऑफ कंटिन्यूसली इंप्रूविंग ऑन थिंग्स आई हैव अचीव एट अ स्टेज where each and every patient have this type of 95% at least 95% of the patients <coughs> have this kind of anesthesia and most of the patients thank me uh, thank you doctor thanks for giving me anesthesia and if you want to achieve this on your patients you just have to be like give proper analgesia wait for the effect of the drugs to wash out no Uh, be in a hurry to remove the supraglottic airway device and thus you can achieve and give the ideal anesthesia to the patients thank you thank you thank you dr pranav uh, i think you've given a you've got good experience in the igels the supraglottic uh, devices all of them are i think excellent the second generation ones are great you can see the video also how smooth the recovery is but i also feel that the use is so versatile that it has to be used by even for say a, a, it's, it's already a part of the into, uh, failed a uh, difficult airway trolley and the rescue oxygenation that can be given but also it has now replaced et tubes for laparoscopic surgeries with steep head low trendland berg position and laparoscopy as long as you know you're careful if you get more experience you use it with the as long as the pressure the leak pressure if you are monitoring the leak pressure and with the use of the second generation especially i gels have shown a maximum leak pressure amongst all the second generation uh uh supraglottic devices especially under uh, perito when the peritoneal insufflation happens and a study was conducted where they uh, checked the leak pressure in trendlenberg position 
with a lot of supraglottic devices and uh, the IGEL was amongst the top. So I do think it has a, a great place future. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Okay, great. Uh, the next uh, topic is going to be uh, done by Dr. Nishkarsh Gupta. He is an additional professor in, on in Onco Anesthesia Palliative Medicine at All India Institute. Uh, also has written 180 articles, 30 book chapters. Interest is airway, skill training and onco anesthesia. His, uh, the topic is should all anticipated difficult intubation be done awake? I think anticipated are you, are you ready? Yeah. Okay. So unanticipated uh, airway is when you have always plan A, B, C, D. Now if you know the uh, intubation is going to be difficult, well at least you can pre-plan before and that's what uh, uh, and Dr. Nishkarsh is going to highlight upon. So all of us know that uh, airway management is synonym with anesthesiologists and we are supposed to handle all kind of cases. And uh, this was an interesting app for uh, which most of us must have read. And they suggested that they found about 184 serious airway complications uh, like aspiration, extubation issues, intubation issues and can't intubate, can't ventilate. And uh, that led to death, brain damage and emergent surgical airway and I'm sure none of us want to get into these kind of situations. And the crux was that poor assessment of airway led to poor planning and poor outcomes. So failure to plan <coughs> is planning to failure. So we have to be as anesthetists plan everything and mostly if you plan well, I'm sure most of the times you don't have that problem. Now coming to difficult airway, you know, this is an old definition all of us know. So we have a conventionally trained anesthesiologist who is having difficulty with fa face mask or fecal intubation or both. That was way back in 2003 when we were residents. Uh, our recent uh, definition 2022 as the previous speaker has talked about supraglottic airway. So that is the kind of a uh, game changer for most anesthesiologists. So it, it has included that it is anticipated or an unanticipated difficulty or failure in an experienced by a physician trained in anesthesia care including but not limited to one or more. So basically it is not limited to intubation of bag mask, but it includes ventilation using a supraglottic airway, intubation of the trachea, extubation or an invasive airway. So the key change is that it, it has included a supraglottic airway, extubation and invasive airway. But the problem is that we do not know who is conventionally trained anesthesiologist. So the global standards are very different and we are not sure what is the benchmark when we say it is a conventionally trained anesthesiologist. And none of the defin definitions have specifically said that how to find the patient has a difficult airway. So that is a still a gray area. We are not sure what is difficult, what is not difficult. Well, there are a lot of uh, factors. So we have human factors. No, we lot of times uh, I worked in corporate hospital for some time. So there were a lot of Iraqi patients and we could not interact with them. So that, that becomes a difficult for us. We don't know what they are speaking. They don't know what we are speaking. And then experience, so if some, some, somebody is not experienced with a new device, better not to use it, especially in a difficult scenario. Well, remote locations, all of us know are difficult, you know, uh, whether it is a non-operating anesthetic, so a room, a non-operating room anesthesia, so whether it is MRI suit or a, or a CT scan, and there are lots of them nowadays. So help is not there, tricky situations, tricky wickets, so you, you, you do get into problem. A lot of uh, problems with radiation therapy post in the neck area so these are tricky patients and many times you no know, especially in emergency we called uh, to intubate and laryngoscope is not working so that is a difficult situation for us to manage the airways so that is quite often in a non ot setting because they're not checking the batteries they're not checking the laryngoscopes that becomes a problem and time pressure is important you no know, we have a hooter coming at 
two minutes before 30 minutes. So that that kind of noise when saturation is falling, it 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 is unnerving for anesthesiologists. So you tend to uh, falter on that. So the incidence is very variable depending on the article, the setting you read. So between uh, less than a percent to about 10 to 15 percent. But the, the the question is that should all difficult airway be intubated awake? So that is a big question. And more importantly, do we need to intubate all difficult airway patients? So it will depend on the setting. So beautifully, last lecture about IGEL. So a lot of the times you need not intubate. So we do not be fixed to an intubation if it is not needed. Uh, the key successful points for intubation are assessment. So assessment is the key. You must assess. You must spend that five minutes to assess the patient. You have to plan what is what is your primary, secondary, tertiary plans and the backup plan. And nowadays we are blessed, so we have oxygen. Uh, we, we can give free oxygenation. We used to give ages, uh, since ages. Then now we have para oxygenation. We have a lot of devices, high flow nasal cannula and other devices. So the idea is that give oxygen whatever amount, whatever uh, device you have, keep on giving it till the airway is secure. So that is the key. So you may not have high flow nasal cannula, but you have an auxiliary port, give 15 liters, th that will do the trick. So it is important to give oxygen all the times. Well, there are a lot of tests, all of us know we are uh, well, uh, uh, there are a lot of tests, so risk factors for bag and mask, impossible ventilation, difficult. So we have pneumonics, moans, groans, so many. And, and there's malampati, upper lip bite test. So multiple tests are there. So the idea is that problem is, are they accurate? The answer is no. So most of them, the sensitivity is about 50%, specificity about close, some of them are about 90. Those, are, those who are sensitive, they are not sensitive. And so we are still not very sure whether we actually, what to do, uh, even if it is a malnumberty 4. It doesn't mean that all malnumberty 4 are to be done away. So that will be really difficult for us and for the patient. So the problem with the test is they are unidirectional. None of the tests will classify the degree of difficulty. So they will not actually say how much is difficult. Many a times we find it is difficult on assessment, it, it turns to be easy. And we, it doesn't tell you when to do, whether to do awake or whether how to plan it. And moreover, there are a lot of plans. So we, we, may have, we give GA, TIVA versus inhalation, face masks, various types, oral nasal intubation, different laryngoscopes, different devices and uh, different ways of doing a can't intubate, can't oxygenate. So we have a lot of uh, possibilities which are there and it's really difficult many times to come to one conclusion. Uh, so if you ask me, so uh, difficult airway is kind of a word which is not right probably. And it is uh, not difficult, but is a uh, airway is either possible or impossible. That is the first classification. Whether you are able to, you will be able to secure in your setting with your means you have, the equipment you have, with, with your expertise, then it is a possible airway, otherwise it is an impossible airway. So it may differ from me or, or different people, different places. So it is not a, a single definition for a difficult air, impossible airway. Important thing is that whether, once we do an airway assessment, we should be really clearly identifying whether we are able to do a bag and, bag and mask, whether supraglottic airway is, insertion is possible, whether intubation is possible, yes, no and whether front of neck access is possible or not. So these are the four important things which we eventually do. And we should be really sure that which, which of them is available for us when we are planning an airway. Because that will help us to plan the management plan for the patients. And this was a beautiful article you must read uh, in, uh, in, I think, this, this year only. So it will tell you about how to do actual assessment and come to the planning part of it. Well, this was a one of our patients. So we had intense, patient had an intense size gap of two centimeters. By the look of it, you know it is a difficult airway. But the question is, should I do it awake? So how many will do awake in this patient? So not many. So my job is easy now, rest of it. So when such patients come, so a lot of them, so we do day in, day out. These are the common patients we face. So the first uh, decision we have to take is whether we do it awake or we do intubation after an induction of anesthesia. Uh, second question is, do we actually uh, do a spontaneous ventilating patient or give a muscle relaxant? Then kind of device which we'll use and what is a surgical or a plan for us in case we fail? Well, this is an interesting slide. So this is a patient, no? How many will do awake in this? I'm sure most of us. So the, the Point I'm trying to make is, so broadly we have bag and mask, supraglottic and endotracheal intubation, three things. If none of them is possible, it is definite awake. There's no question about it. So if all the three are not possible for some reason or the other, 
will definitely do awake and th 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 there is no confusion in it. So now coming to what is awake intubation. <coughs> awake intubation is something which tube is placed awake in a spontaneously breathing patient before induction of anesthesia. And you can use any device, FOB is mostly used, or video laryngoscope or a direct laryngoscope depending on what you are comfortable with. Advantages which is being touted, yes, yes it is favorable safety profile. So the ventilation is being preserved, the tone is there, so even if you are not able to intubate, patient will still make it. And you, patient is trying, can maintain a gas exchange potency and protection against aspiration. So this was the uh, interesting article in 2017 and they also talked about stratifying the patients between low and high risk. So that is the key and then ability to deal with them as, as per their difficulty and high risk should be done awake that is for sure. And they had done, this is another article which had, they had done about 1500 patients and they found awake intubation was more or less safe and the the practice of awake intubation was similar in past 20 years, so it has not changed. So overall use of awake intubation has not increased, despite having more complex cases which we are doing nowadays. And uh, this was a, again an interesting article, they had given guidelines about awake critical intubation and they had given how to actually do it, so included counselling, consent, optimal pre-medication and uh, airway potency, airway blocks. So they talked only about topicalization. So uh, I had written a rebuttal to this. So the point is that if you are doing awake, it is a difficult airway and you might need to uh, activate a CICU situation. You might need to do a surgical airway. Why not do a transtracheal block to give anesthesia? The, the, the advantage is that you have actually pierced the trachea. You have get that feel of the situation. In case CICU is there, you can actually do a, a scalpel crico and a, save the patient. So important thing is that you, because we are not used to puncturing trachea, we are not used to doing a cricothyroid puncture mostly. So if it, it is a un, un, unanticipated or a CICO otherwise, you will not be able to do I am sure about it because we are not, we have not done it in our lives. So that is the, if you are doing awake, better do a transtracheal block to anesthetize because you get that feel to do it once it is needed in emergency. So the, the problem with awake is that it is not purely awake. So I think ma'am talked about giving sedation during awake and most of the drugs except dexmedrimidine will have some kind of muscle accent effect. So it will depress consciousness, may, may predispose, predispose the patient to aspiration and patients are struggling when we do awake, how, however good awake anesthesia we give, how, the depending best of the blocks still patient will be struggling. So you may have regurgitation, gagging is there. And because of LA, laryngeal reflexes may be depressed and, and actually patient might aspirate. So it is not a foolproof mechanism that patient is, will be all good when you are doing awake. Other problems are that it is time consuming, yes, uh, distressing to the patient. This is very important. We all, as anesthetists, we are there to remove pain, remove uh, distress, remove agony because of surgery and we <coughs> ourselves are inflicting pain to the patient. It, it is not justified. Uh, then you may not be experienced enough, so it becomes difficult. If there is a bleeding, then it, again it is a problem. Hemodynamic response will be more. CAD, hypertensive patients, not a good idea. Then some settings like children, uncooperative, mentally retarded, it will be, you cannot do awake actually. And more importantly, awake will never give you an optimal intubating condition. So this is a suboptimal intubating condition in a patient who is a potential difficult airway. So, it is a difficult situation and you are trying to do something which is not an optimal situation for us. So now coming to what is optimal laryngoscopy. So it says reasonably experienced anesthesiologist, uh, three years full training, use of optimal positioning, sniffing or depending on whatever device you are using, then no significant muscle tone. This is important. So the larynx should be relaxed, patient should be relaxed, things should be comfortable and you should be able to intubate. And you can use OELM or BURB to optimize the view and use an optimum plate. The question is, does awake intubation provide most optimal attempt? The answer is no. So it doesn't provide an optimal attempt and it should be carefully used uh, in a setting. Uh, this is one of the few articles which will tell you about flip sides of awake intubation. Uh, the, and some of the patients are really scary and they'll say it was uncomfortable to get something in your throat but it went well, I got sedated 
and the, uh, it sounded as so nasty I didn't really know what instruments look like. I thought, oh God, how will it be done? I imagine some big instrument that was put inside my throat. And these memories will stay with the patient throughout their life. That is important. So we have to be really, really careful while choosing a wig. Uh, well, uh, this was an interesting article and they actually said that it is time to ab abandon awake in fiber optic intubation as a routine standard of care in all po difficult airway situations and it should be used only cautiously, only, only if it is needed. Well, this is, this is our experience, so we uh, retrospectively, uh, since we do a lot of cases, about 200 to 250 at least per year, maybe more. So we did about uh, six years data which was uh, collected and we found the awake intubation was done only in about 20% uh, of them. So all of them are difficult airway. Of those, only 20% were done awake. So what we had done was, so we, we found that, so single tests are not important, not very good. So we, uh, Algronzi risk index is there well, well established. So we, we retrospectively uh, clubbed the analysis data into this index and try to find out, depending on the grade of difficulty, when was awake chosen. So interestingly, if it was EGRI was more than seven, all patients were done awake. So this is important. So if it is extremely difficult, as, as I showed in the initial slide, so when we have a difficult bag and mask, difficult intubation, difficult supraglottic, definitely you go for awake. There is no question about it. But in other patients, mostly, uh, if one of the three things was possible, we could easily do under anesthesia with muscle relaxation. So the take home message is that advances in airway management, the need for awake intubation is decreasing. It should be only considered when both bag and mask and SAD placement are difficult. There is a risk of aspiration and we are not well equipped and skilled. Awake intubation is not without risk and many perceive it as time consuming, more importantly distressing and is potentially unsafe. And the dictum is that do whatever you are best doing at, so don't fall into anybody's trap. So do, do, the thing you are doing routinely, do it in a patient who is difficult as well. So there were some videos. So we'll come back to the same. So how many will do still do awake in these patients? Not many? So good. Uh, video I'll skip, so not, uh, uh, not much time. So, and this was my last slide. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Nishkash. Very well. I completely agree with you on the transtracheal. I do it all the time for whenever I have to do it. As you're rightly saying, not only does it give good anesthesia, but also you have a feel of the front of neck in case of a trouble, you know where to go for. So that certainly is one. Uh, and with so many, what I feel is with so many, new, so much new knowledge coming in about video laryngoscopes, uh, the techniques, the methods, I think, and the skills that you need to go along with it. So apart from the knowledge, the skills, you should know when to use what. That is, that, that is important because if there's no mouth opening, I mean very little mouth opening, uh, I don't think a, a, a video laryngoscope would really be helpful. But Yes, if there is an other factors, then certainly video where it can be used. And the other thing is you should be experienced using it and you keep using it. And that's how, you know, you will develop the skill and the ideas. Absolutely. So, yeah. In Good. fact, uh, in, in our oral cancer case, cases also, earlier we used to do all fiber optic bronchoscopy. Nowadays, about 50 to 60 percent we do Correct. with a video laryngoscope. Because it gives you that much more comfort because we are more used to handling a laryngoscope. Correct. And bleeding, nasal bleeding is actually minimum with a laryngoscope. Even if it occurs, the view is still better than using a bronchoscope in a bleeding nose. So that way, you are better off using a video laryngoscope. And in fact, when you're using fiber optic, as you were saying, a good local anesthesia is very important. And in fact, I remember in the year 2000, 2001, I was in Norwich and I attended a fiber optic. That time fiber optic was relatively, and you know, we were made to do fiber optic on one another. So I was given anesthesia and the, the person that I put the fiber optic, I was giving. So all students, all amongst us. And that's how you really know, you know, that I have to give a proper local anesthesia. The pain of bronchoscope, you must that have feel, realized. You should, uh -huh. you should have the feel of that scope going in, really. That is true. Then you'll always give good, good local anesthesia. 
Thank you, sir. Okay, thanks. Sir. On the different techniques of uh, uh, managing a difficult airway, from a practicing intensivist point of view, I thought I'd just bring a different perspective. Like uh, when we go through the ASA algorithms and anything uh, to do with airway management written from an anesthesia perspective, there is an overemphasis on the anatomical difficulty. But we know that since the COVID times, uh, the airway management, is anatomy is only half the story. It is also the physiological derangement. And when we approach even a box standard airway, which is deemed anatomically easy, but if the patient is on, uh, say, large amount of PEEP, like uh, a big fat fellow, 25 and 15 of PEEP with an FIOT of 60%, it is a different kettle of fish. And we have noticed when our anesthesia colleagues who do not uh, usually have to encounter these patients and they have to help us out, uh, there is a bit of a struggle and they sometimes go on a tangent, you know, uh, suggesting things like we will do fiber optic and you could say, well, this is not gonna end well. This is not the right case. So it'll be nice to know that we have a perspective of the physiological difficulty and challenges in airway management. Uh, because I'm pretty sure in, uh, there's great change in the trend of uh, we ventilating patients, we leave them longer in most subcategories uh, on NIV and when they fail to appreciate and then uh, what techniques would you use? interesting question and uh, so there are two things uh, physiologically difficult airway you will have to be time efficient while managing there you cannot wait for 60 seconds or maybe 90 seconds to intubate and bronchoscopy probably will not be the right choice uh, if, if I have to handle such a case first thing I will do is first I'll give probably a high flow if I, I have available in the setup I have but it, if it is not on other patient or give oxygen uh, through a nasal prong about 10 to 15 liters and I'll use albedo laryngoscope. If there is a problem, second thing which I can do as a backup plan is I will put in an eye gel or uh, any other supraglottic through which I can intubate and I can pass the bronchoscope th through the eye gel and intubate. The advantage is that the ventilation is going on till the patient is intubated and you get that much more time uh, when the patient is tricky and you don't have enough, uh, uh, I'll say minute, even minute becomes challenging. So about, about 10 seconds or so you should be able to intubate. I may make a small comment on that. So when we pre-oxygenate a patient on NIV, it is always on the non-invasive. If we try to take the mask off, the 15 liters is gonna be useless, or even the high flow, they won't be able to de deliver. And the other important thing is that we uh. must be mentally prepared. What is the degree of desaturation which would warrant your change of plan? You know, I can say when they're really sick, you have to mentally be prepared that they will desaturate into the 50s and 60s, but that's yeah. fine. If you think you're pretty, you can make a, uh, visual alignment, even if they're desaturated into the 50s, that's your best chance to get it in. You know, uh, we don't want to be in the cycle where you panic and then putting back on and back mask. And once they de recruit, there is no way on earth their saturation is coming to the 80s and things for very, very protracted periods. So, uh, as a part of our mental preparation, we say, <coughs> I know this patient will desaturate into the 50s and 60s. We make it very clear to the team. And I'm not going to show an eye gel because he desaturated 70 and abandoned my right. attempt. If I could see, I just get it done. So yeah, that's I, one of the I, small learning points. I, yeah, I, I agree with you 100%. Uh, what I would additionally do is in an ICU uh, setting is get the expert who's, ex who's an expert. Don't get the resident or the senior resident to do the intubation if required. Get the expert. And again, you know, if the expert feels that the intubation uh, would be easy on the assessment, then I'd just go for it. That's right. Yeah, yeah. the desaturation yeah, yeah, doesn't yeah. count. Get on with it. And yes, if I feel that there is a likelihood of a difficulty, then, you know, you can get the other video laryngoscopes in along with the ventilation continuing but yes the only That's problem right. with the video laryngoscope is intubation is always challenging so you get a good view within few but you seconds. can't intubate correct ah, that so happens you have to be really prepared and so use a device which you are using it routinely correct, correct. so as i now ki, matlab, you end up using a device and you are doing it for you. the first time and it is a soup for all of us i uh, just wanted to share one <laughs> intubation i uh, had helped with in this was a call from medical ICU and that too, you know, like, uh, I just happened to be there in the theater still late. So they were having trouble and they called me. This is a very obese patient and uh, 
looking at the patient, it was obvious that it was going to be a very difficult uh, intubation. And that was the patient, uh, I don't know if Vikram remembers, but um, I was, uh, and the patient was on, like he described, on a very high PEEP and um, marginal oxygenation, even on 100% FiO2 and stuff. So we uh, intubated him, we put in a fast track, ventilated him and then intubated him and luckily the tube went in straight away with the, uh, through the fast track. So I, I just thought that, you know, that um, just share that, uh, that it was a very, it was a successful and the <laughs> medical ICU guys were so impressed, you know, <laughs> they had been struggling with it for so long and this was kind of done in five minutes. <laughs> Uh, once the Absolutely, on the came. intubating LMAs are actually good and but underused nowadays for yeah. various no, reasons. they are not used. Not in using fact, it. They, they, we are not yeah. using them so much. But then that patient, I was uh, I was really saved with uh, mm -hmm. uh, with that. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. Okay. Uh, then great. So the. Next topic is high flow nasal oxygen therapy. Now, I think we are on a gold mine here. This is a rare, great potential to change the complete protocol of you know, difficult airway management. So in COVID times, we have realized the real use of the high flow nasal oxygen. And so and we subsequently realized that you can really buy time even say, for example, a resident doing an intubation in the middle of the night, and suppose he's not able to intubate, patient needs intubation, patient is desaturating, he can just put a high flow nasal, it buys time for at least 25, 30 minutes. And even it, not only does it oxygenate, but it also helps in keeping the CO2 relatively not that high. So I think it has a great potential. Let's invite uh, the speaker. Uh, Dr. Shishir Agarwal is a senior consultant uh, at Lucknow. Area of interest, regional anesthesia, Chai transplant anesthesia, Chai anesthesia for airway surgery. Thank you, sir. Yeah. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you for inviting me here. Yeah. Thank you, Hetal Bhai and Anil Bhai for giving me opportunity to, sp uh, to speak on my favorite topic. So, when it comes to the me and my friend Dr. Uh, Dr. Rakesh Mishra, uh, Dr. Dr. Rakesh Mishra, he is a very good friend of me. He is the ENT surgeon. But when it comes to the airway surgery, we fight like each, uh, this. We fight for the airway spaces. So my topic here is high flow nasal cannula, a game changer in the airway surgeries. Let us see. Is it really a game changer? This is the first video where this is a two day old child who presented with inspiratory stridor. Later it was diagnosed a patient of laryngomalacia. So what happens in the laryngomalacia? In the laryngomalacia there is some loose floppy supraglottic tissue like epiglottis is floppy and loose and it obstructs airway during inspiration which is the cause of inspiratory stridor and hypoxia. So for this epiglottoplasty is being done using carbon dioxide laser, high flow nasal cannula, TIVA under the spontaneous respiration. Look here, surgeon is resecting extra tissue as well as he is creating a scar on the anterior surface of the epiglottis to open the airway. This is the second case where vocal cord polyp is being excised using CO2 laser, HFNC. Apnea is created using a tracheidium and patient is being done in the TIVA. This is third patient where vocal cord web is excised using HFNC, CO2 laser, TIVA and apnea, apneic respiration. And this is the fourth patient where a two days, two uh, year old boy, he has aspirated most common foreign body which is the peanut and it got stuck into the right bronchus. So surgeon is removing, removing this foreign body using his rigid bronchoscope under the spontaneous respiration. I am using HFNC and the T1 in this patient. The maximum duration of the anesthesia which I gave in the foreign body removal is the two and a half hour. So 
those who have worked in the uh, covid period during the icu they must be knowing this machine it is a very simple machine it contains a humidifier and a bl simple blender we have a, uh, it also contains a specialized flow meter which can deliver oxygen flow up to the 70 liter per minute and a interface which is the nasal prong <coughs> so how can we initiate the high flow nasal cannula to, in to initiate high flow nasal cannula we require clear airway nasal cavity should be clear airway should be patent and for the initiation of the high flow nasal cannula we should take a adequate size of nasal cannula so size of the nasal cannula should be half of the diameter of the nostril Regarding flow setting, it should be two liter per minute in the neonates and uh, neonates and uh, uh, infants. But in the children, more than 10 kg, or in the adults, flow setting should be one liter per kg. Patient should be pre-oxygenated for 10 minutes in the semi-sitting position to 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 optimize pre-oxygenation because the semi-sitting position will help in the recruit recruitment of the lung and it will Im further improve the oxygenation. So, how in this patient anesthesia was given? In this patient, pre medication was given using uh, glycoparillate, small doses of fentanyl and ketamine was given. Dexam was given as a bolus. My formula is body weight multiplied by 1.5 per hour for the 10 minutes as a bolus, followed by one tenth of this initial bolus for the maintenance. Along with Dexam, propofol infusion was given. 10% lignocaine was sprayed to attenuate laryngoscopic response. But in those patients where surgery is planned for the upper uh, uh, on the vocal cord, like in the uh, second patient where the surgery was performed on the vocal cord for the vocal cord polyp removal and for the uh, vocal cord web surgeries, atraculum bolus was given. <coughs> Sometimes I use bag mask ventilate for the further recruitment of the lung. In my cases, average apnea time was around 14 to 15 minutes. But in uh, few cases, few publications are there where they have achieved the apnea time up to 30 minutes using this HFNC. But the only limiting factor is the retention of carbon dioxide. So after completion of surgery, infusion is stopped. ABG was done uh, in, the, in all the patients after the 10 minutes because we cannot monitor here the entitled carbon dioxide. So ABG uh, repetition is must every 10 minutes in these patients. So patient was reversed using laryngeal mask airway after the completion of the surgery. There are few factors where apnea time, we cannot get the uh, optimum uh, apnea time in those patients where pre-oxygenation is not adequate, like in obese patient, in um, patients where there is airway obstruction or in the uh, or the nasal obstruction or on in those patients where the demand is very high like the pregnant patients so how this case was done adequate size nasal cannula was fixed meanwhile dexam and propofol infusion started after deep sedation airway was maintained using head tilt chin lift and jaw thrust you can see here you can appreciate here the tongue sutures were applied here to retract the tongue to to gain um, optimum pre-oxygenation. And after spraying the 10% lignocaine, patient was handed over to the surgeon. For in in these patients, backup plan was the head tilt, chin lift, jaw thrust, as well as tongue sutures. Sometimes intermediate mask ventilation was required, but the ultimate Rescuer was my ENT surgeon. He is the my ultimate rescuer. He can slide endotracheal tube using his rigid bronchoscope, and the jet ventilation were also kept as a backup. There are few contraindications of the high flow nasal cannula, which is the nasal obstruction or injury, and base of the skull fracture where there is a risk of pneumo uh, pneumocephalus. So, few known complications are the pneumothorax, gastric distension and the local trauma and the sometime discomfort to the patient.
so there is a question that can we use the high flow nasal cannula in the laser surgery is there a risk of the airway fire using this high flow nasal cannula in the airway surgery so for the any fire this triangle is required oxygen source and the fuel which is the endotracheal tube in these airway uh, cases but in my cases as tubeless anesthesia was given this fuel is not there so there was no case reported as far of the airway fire uh, airway fire after this hfnc in laser surgery but the surrounding atmosphere is the rich with the 100% oxygen so one case is reported where there is a burn or uh, with the using diathermy in the only in the surrounding area not in the to the into the airway so my strategy in these patients are i cover all the exposed area with the wet sponges laser beam is used as a short in a short burst i usually apply suction to dilute the surrounding oxygen in the atmosphere so how does it act like we usually give very high flow around 60 to 70 liter per minute in these patients which flushes out all the nitrogen as well as carbon dioxide from the nasopharynx as well as in the lower airway there is no possibility of entrainment of the air because flow uh, flow is very high around 60 to 70 liter so risk of dilution is very low you can appreciate here red color is depicting the nitrous uh, nitrogen and this blue is oxygen so with the high flow this uh, nitrogen is replaced with the 100% of the oxygen so how does it helps in the apneic ventilation it is it acts like on the principle of the uh, a ventilatory mass flow so you can appreciate here 250 around 250 ml of the oxygen is absorbed into the blood stream in, from the alveoli while the only 20 ml of the carbon dioxide is released into the alveoli from the blood stream so there is a difference of the 220 ml which is equivalent to around minus 20 cm of water so oxygen is sucked in through the nasopharynx and this alveoli is filled with the 100% oxygen not only this this hfnc also helps in the uh, co2 clearance because here if you can appreciate the uh, carbon dioxide level is rose up to uh, around 3 mm of mercury every minutes but while in the patient where uh, hfnc was used it was around 1 mm of mercury per minute so when it helps in the into the co2 clearance not only the co2 clearance and oxygenation it also helps into the generation of the peep around 1 cm of the 1 cm water of the peep is generated with the 10 liter of oxygen flow but this peep is lost as the patient open his mouth it remains only one third of it so in this way high flow nasal cannula is a game changer in airway surgery any question <coughs> so take home message is this hfnc is a newer tool which increases apnea time it can be used to provide tubeless anesthesia which may be a game changer for the airway surgeries because surgeon gets a better view and there is a minimum risk of the laser airway fire there is a minimum risk of laser airway fire Thank you all of you for patient hearing. Thank you, Dr. Rakesh Shivastav, who is the my ENT surgeon, who has encouraged me to use high flow nasal cannula. Now we mo no more fight with each other for the during the airway cases. We are not friends. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Dr. Shishir. Very well done. I think this H HFNC is going to be a game changer. This is my feeling. In the next few years. this is going to be part of protocols for difficult airway management for various surgeries it's going to be a big game and i completely agree with you thank you uh, so uh, i think there was a request from dr shailender to share some experience on his air, uh, airway uh, he's a, it's a special request uh, kindly be brief dr shailender please
हेलो एवरीवन थैंक यू ऑर्गेनाइजर्स फॉर गिविंग मी टाइम आउट ऑफ देयर बिजी शेड्यूल टू शेयर माय एक्सपीरियंस वी वर डिस्क वी हैड अ सेशन टुडे रिगार्डिंग फ्री लेंस एन एस सी सेशन एंड वी हैड अ लॉट ऑफ चैलेंजेस दैट आर फेस्ड बाय द फ्री लेंस एन इन द प्राइवेट प्रैक्टिस सो आई थॉट ऑफ शेयरिंग माई पर्सनल एक्सपीरियंसिस हाउ वन कैन ओवरकम इट and i am uh, thankful to dr vikram dr nilesh mithanka dr sushil who have uh, elaborated the challenges uh, there is a disclosure uh, i am not against any of the previous speakers moreover i am may be using a little bit uh, uh, some of the offensive words uh, during my talk so first uh, uh, many a times a freelance and a studies is always in a hurry to get new cases but believe me वन शुड हैव पेशेंस एंड ऑलवेज कीप इन माइंड के अपना टाइम आएगा इन द मीन टाइम ही शुड इंक्रीज ही शुड हैव अ गुड इमेज बाई हिज वर्क ही शुड कीप ऑन अटेंडिंग कॉन्फ्रेंसिस वर्कशॉप मास्टर द ब्लॉक्स सो दैट ही कैन गेट द केसेज डन मोर ओवर वन शुड गेट अ गुड ग्रुप ऑफ अन स्टेटिस्ट वेयर मेम्बर्स कैन हेल्प ईच अदर and there should be a clear cut policy that no one will uh, invade another the anesthetic center many a times it's all it is always a tension among the anesthetists that if i am going to send someone on my center he will snatch it away but if we respect each other we can be of help to each other now initially i used to carry uh, my bag to the hospitals in which i all uh, already had was having uh, igels bougie stilets and everything but once i started working on the uh, centers i keep keep on equipping the ot's i initially convinced the surgeon that you should get these things in the ot i personally called the medical representatives to arrange those stuff in the pharmacy at the dealer price not the mrp once the stuff was in the pharmacy we used to ask patient to purchase it use the so for example nasopharyngeal airway we used to ask the patient to purchase it once it was used in the patient we used to keep it in the ot and for next time this nasopharyngeal airway was available for my use in the ot so surgeon was also happy that he has doesn't have to share a penny he doesn't have to spare a penny for purchasing it moreover we should wait for the right opportunity the gastroenterologist with whom i was working till recently uh, he had a patient uh, he had a, one of the patient collapsed while a staff was giving antibiotic bolus antibiotic in tenable syringe and he told me that he could not uh, revive the patient as uh, he is not well versed with the intubation i told him that you should keep igel at your center and uh, i can teach you how to use igel and it is so easy to insert the igel that even a sweeper can insert it in case of the emergency the very next day he purchased the igel and i asked him to uh, to take uh, help and to introduce igel himself and he was so happy he asked me ho gaya bas itna hi karna hai maine kaha this is the way of introducing the igel and this way i convinced many surgeons to keep igels in their centers for the sake of cpr or for reviving the patients moreover many patients many of the surgeons they are not interested in purchasing the ventilators i tell them that uh, if you are doing many laparoscopic cases on the uh, what we say boils machine you are wasting the gases while we are just ventilating the patient if you are going to purchase the ventilator you will save the payment on the gases in 1 to 2 years and moreover if i can do if i can keep patient alive on this workstation for 8 hours for a surgery in case of emergency you can use this ventilator as a workstation as a ventilator many of the fish surgeons and hospital owners they they were convinced by this statement and i managed to get four workstations in installed at these hospitals i took little bit of pain i personally talked to the uh, medical representative of that particular g and uh, mindray works workstation they offer i asked them to reduce the price to offer them emis they said ke sir company nahi karegi 
So I asked him that tell the company or tell your seniors that if you are, they are not going to give EMIs, these guys will never purchase the workstations and you will lose this money. Once the, uh, the, once the owners or the hospitals have purchased the machine, you can easily earn in the AMCs only. So we can uh, use this opportunity. Moreover, there was a, a conference uh, by the FOGSI and uh, all of the OBG surgeons was present there. They asked us, requested our team to conduct an airway session. And they, like all other surgeons especially, gynecologists are always uh, interested in intubations. We did have a share, we did have a setup, we did have a station for the intubation, but we introduced the IGEL at that time. Uh, Dr. Shilinder, so sorry, uh, we are running short of time. No problem, uh, can sir. you please share your experience on the F FP group? Sorry. Yeah. Uh, uh, so, time to honor our faculty. May I ask all the faculties of the session to please come forward? Dr. Vidya, ma'am, Dr. Nishkash, Dr. Pranav. Any quick questions, please? Just one or two. See, the problem in this session is that the uh, moderator is so experienced in teaching all these things to us in the department also. And uh, sir, being an avid golfer and a cricketer, uh, sometimes T20 and sometimes 18 whole go golf course strategy comes into play. So I think most of the questions are answered. We can proceed, right? So, may I ask Dr. Siva Kota to honor uh, our moderator, Dr. Vikram, please. May I request uh, uh, Dr. Anupam to honor Dr. Pranav Gupta, please? Now, this is a very unique presentation, a uh, uh, junior presenting to the senior. Dr. Uh, Dr. Anshuman to present a memento to Dr. Nishkas, please. Uh, and uh, I think I have to present it to Dr. Vidya, ma'am. I owe you a lot, lot, madam. I know you flew in from Bangalore. Please, ma'am. May I, may I request Dr. Arun Mehra to present the memento, please? Shishir. Thank you. Uh, 